I have to say I have this mighty cold, so sorry about that. So if I cough and sneeze, bear with me. I'm trying to battle through it. Uh, but apart from that, um, I would like to share with you the outcomes from the Coffee Barometer. It's a publication that uh, comes out every four years and is published by a group of organizations that try to be independent. And when we published the report, we came to the conclusion that trouble is brewing in the coffee sector. The barometer comes up from market research. We also do some literature review. And also, we send some specific questionnaires to the key roasters and the key um, traders, the, the top traders in the world. And when this comes, what it gives you is a report that is very succinct, and it shares what are the key trends that are happening in the market. And also, it provides an update regarding sustainability. So how is the sector doing regarding sustainability? So we believe that trouble is brewing in the coffee sector, and at the moment, many of us are currently being spectators. I'd like to start with you sharing the, the first conclusion, or one of the first trends that we have, market consolidation. Billions have been spent in mergers and acquisitions in the last four years. In the 2014, edition of the barometer, we say that three corporations dominated the market. Nestle, Mondelez, and the Master Blenders. Today, we have two giants, Nestle, still there, and JB Holding. And the latter is not a coffee company, it's a German investment firm. I was speaking the morning, show this. I'm not going to try to explain this to you, it's far too complicated, even when the designer sent to us, I couldn't understand the relationship, you know. Sarah Lee, the master blender, Jaco Dow Egbert, it's too complicated, we don't have the time. But what is clear is that big companies are merging. Mainstream brands are buying specialty brands. Giants are making alliances. It's what we saw last year with Nestle and, and Starbucks last October. Even standards are merging. So, but the question here is, why does this matter to sustainability? Why do we care about this? It matters to sustainability, first, because this is creating downward pressure on trading that ultimately affects producers. It also matters because when a company, and it's normal, starts to go through a merger to an acquisition, all these companies have policies, they have uh, programs, initiatives that are related to sustainability. And when they go through these acquisitions and these mergers, these programs related to sustainability are either on hold, they're put on hold in the fridge, or forgotten. Let's try to zoom in the linkages between trading and market consolidation. These bigger companies are now have greater negotiation power, and they started to ask traders to change some of the terms. So for instance, changing the terms of payment. So traditionally, or until a couple of years, we have you will buy a container of coffee, you will wait 30 days as a trader, and then you will get your payment. Now, we're moving from 30 to 180 days. So we're moving from one month to six months. And to be able to manage that, you have to be part, you have to have the financial muscle and being one of these top traders. Because you can bear those financial risks, you can bear waiting for longer. But if you're a medium trader, a smaller trader, then that's more difficult. And what happens is that these medium traders and smaller traders, then they have to again say to the producers, we're changing the terms as well. And this is exactly what we don't want to see. We don't want to see the pressure going down with producers. But this is happening. 
But the question that many people have is, okay, what is the link between these new terms of payment and market consolidation? And the answer here is actually quite interesting because many believe that by changing the trace, terms of uh, payment, moving from one month to six months, the sector, the industry, is able to free some capital that then is invested in mergers and acquisition. So we're seeing all these linkages between these two trends. Now I'd like to focus a little bit on, on production. As we saw this morning, productivity, we have had highest records on, on volumes. Last year, we have 168 million bags. Fantastic news. If you look at Robusta only, in the last 10 years, they have had a 40% increase in volumes. This is huge. And this is great news. And again, we see here consolidation, which is the key word of the majority of the trends that we have seen. This morning, we're talking about, Rick talked about five countries. Four countries produce the majority of the volumes in the world, Vietnam, Brazil and Vietnam, Colombia and Indonesia at a different level, Honduras there, five countries. But what we found as well at the same time is that the Food and Agricultural Organization, because we review this data every four years in the barometer, is that they were reporting exactly the same total area producing country, producing coffee, sorry, in the world that, we, that it was producing country four years ago. So we had an increase in production, 168 million bags, but the total production area remained exactly the same, 10 million hectares. And then, if we look at climate change, and everyone knows that this is already affecting, if we look at the issues of prices, then producers should be either opening, moving to other places to continue to produce Arabica, for instance, or they should be stopped being coffee, producing, coffee producers, as David was saying, because the prices are too low. So who wants to produce coffee? But no, the numbers remain exactly the same. So same hectares, same number of farmers, and we just stuck on that. So that made us believe that we saw two options here. First, either there has been an in, in, a steady increase in production in the same area, which is the case, for instance, for Brazil, that has invested in technology heavily, equally Colombia, partly, not saying this because I'm Colombia, but with the renovation, and all producers, in fact, are opening the agricultural border, and sometimes this is within their own farms. So don't think about a producer going to a national park and, 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 and doing deforestation. No, this is within their own farms. So this is the next trend. So what is the big question here is, what is the link between coffee and deforestation? And today, 60% of the land suitable to produce coffee is forest and only 20% of this land is protected. So it is very likely that the majority of coffee producers in the world are contributing to national deforestation levels, possibly with the exception of Brazil, that has invested in technology a lot. And this is something we have to think about, because demand is increasing, and for a sector, that claims to be working towards sustainability, we have to be very careful where those volumes are coming from. And now, this is a second very important part of the report. Let's zoom in sustainability. The coffee barometer also reviews what is the data available regarding verification and certification standards. And as we saw, and was mentioned this morning by different speakers, at the moment, 55% of global production is either verified or certified. And 20% of those volumes are sourced by the market as such. 
So we have Merlin saying, you know, I have fair trade coffee, but not all the coffee is sold as such. That's the reality. And if you look at this graph, and you look at the top, so this is the total volume produced, 55% of total production. But if you look at, with the exception of cafe practices, which is the code for Starbucks, and triple eight, the code for Nespresso, the majority of the standards are struggling to put their volumes in the market. And I don't think this is news. We, we all know this. But this is where the sector is at the moment. But when we talk about sustainability, and this is um, one of the areas of the report that has generated more interest, it comes to the issue of value distribution. Not much about price, but value distribution. And why is this? It's because we believe that within in the, in the coffee sector, there is a systemic underinvestment in both production and sustainability. And why is this? The total value of the global coffee category annually is 200 billion. The value of the green coffee is 20 that is exported and the investment in sustainability annually is $350 million. $200 billion, $20 billion, $350 million. This means that 10% of the value generated by the industry globally is currently directly reaching producing countries. And the annual invest investment in sustainability is less than 1%. It is, in fact, not 0.25, but for the just less than 1%. And I want to give you a breakdown of this. Half of this less than 1% is invested through premium sustainability uh, verification and, 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 and um, certification premium. So pay by, uh, through the standards. 10% is various and non too complicated to follow up. And 20% is invested by public donors. And the investment done by the private sector directly on issues affecting production and sustainability is only 20%. So these are tailor-made solutions to a specific issues. Less than 20%. I would like to share with you the last trend that we have seen in the last four years when we did review and we published the coffee barometer, which is collaboration in the sector. And this is great news, because this is something that other sectors are doing, cocoa, for instance, but coffee is doing quite well, and this is, this is great. In the last four years, we have been an explosion of what we call multi-stakeholder initiatives that are pre-competitive. This is a lot of jargon, but basically what it means is that everyone is getting together to try to work related to issues, sustainability issues. These are some of the initiatives that are better known in the sector or perhaps more established. CGCP, SAFE, a sustainable Coffee Challenge, the national platforms. And the great news, I think, here is that people are getting together because they stand, they're starting to understand that the issues that they are trying to resolve are too big for them to find a solution, that their contribution is limited. And if they team up with others, perhaps they can have a greater impact. They also are aware that actually, there are, there's a lot of duplication. We're visiting the same producers, we go to the same places. So perhaps by teaming up with others, you're avoiding duplication and you stop working in isolation. And this is a fantastic trend that we're seeing in the sector. And the next challenge for these initiatives is to move from consensus to action, meaning moving from consensus Yes, I'm happy to work with you, even if you are a competitor in the market, even if you are my competitor, to action. How do we do this practically in the field? Am I happy to send my agronomist with your agronomist to, to the field? Am I happy to share information? 
We have to move from talking in lovely meetings in Boston, in Zurich, in all, where we all meet always, to action in the field. But before I leave, and if you're sleeping, wake up, because I would like to discuss this tomorrow. Um, this is the moment, this is a terrible time, you know, afternoon, really dark. But what I like a lot about the barometer is that every time we publish it, it creates reaction. Some people are positive, negative, complaints, we receive everything, and we, we like it. And some as well, they give us ideas, and some people dare to say, let's do this, and some of the ideas I would like to share with you, because a lot of people have said to us, look, if the production just focus on four countries, on five countries, why don't we just focus on that? Let's forget about the rest. So Brazil, Vietnam, Colombia, Indonesia, Honduras. Let's just work on that. And the other ones will try to sort up themselves. But my question to you is that as the speciality industry, what will be the impact on the speciality if we only focus on those top producing countries? Can we do this? How does it affect your industry? Equally, we have seen, and we mentioned today, people are drinking more coffee, great news, millennials, they care about sustainability, as Rick mentioned this morning. We need more coffee to feed demand. But what I would like to discuss with you tomorrow in our session is, can the industry generate more volumes, so or can we bear the risk of generating more volumes that are linked to deforestation? Is the industry ready to support the production of deforestation-free coffee? Can we do that? I don't have the answer to this, but it's something that we have to start to discuss. And then finally, the whole morning we talk about prices, about, you know, how, what do we do? There's a lot of frustration, and there's a lot of frustration because the industry is lucrative, and everyone is asking this question. If we are making more money, if people are drinking more coffee, why is not everyone winning? And to answer the, this question, I believe that starting talking about prices is good. We're putting the issue on the table, but I think we need to start to think about value distribution too. How do we do that structurally? So trouble is bringing the coffee sector, and we need to decide today if we are agents of change or if we are spectators. I thank you for your time.